Hi, everyone who's joining. Um, welcome back to the Bali's Living Arts series. It's still a little bit early, so um, we're gonna keep on letting people filter in. Um, as I'm sure you know, this week we have um, composing between Gamelan and Balagandrar, uh, sorry, between Balagandrar and Math Metal with um, Putu Hiramaena, who has uh, joined us from Colorado. <laughs> Hello. where it's still not too late. I know many of us who are coming from the west coast, from the east coast of the US are having uh, late nights. Indeed. So that was the thing I, I forgot to ask you, but um, uh, these are being recorded. Are they also being posted to a particular place for people to watch? Yeah, so um, all of the Bali's Living Arts webinars are being recorded um, and they will be posted on the Gamelan Sukarjaya YouTube channel in late September after the whole series is over um, and we're working on getting bilingual subtitles for all of them. Very nice. And it's now seven o'clock. Um, welcome to everyone who's here. Um, you can feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, I know we're in a webinar, so um, you won't be able to see the other attendees, which is unfortunate, um, but you can use the chat function um, to say hi, um, let your friends know you're here, say where you're coming from. I see some people using that. Um, make sure you're using all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see it, um, not just me and Putu. Yeah, we've got people from San Diego coming in. Um, mm. So welcome again to the Bali's Living Arts series. Um, this is the third installment. Um, and uh, this is Gamelan Sukarjaya's first online only event. Um, we started doing this um, to try to give back to communities in Bali. Um, we're collecting donations for um, uh, to distribute, um, distribute care packages to former GSGA guest artists in Bali. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who has been contributing to that fund. Um, and so I guess um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's amazing presenter, um, Hututankas Adi Hiramayena, who is coming to us um, from Colorado. Um, he's an artist scholar who currently holds positions as faculty at Metropolitan State University of Denver and the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Um, and today he's going to be presenting on um, composing uh, between Alejandrar and math metal. Um, I know, Putu, you had a little bit to say before we jump into the presentation, right? Sure, yeah. Thank you, Ma Rebecca and Om Swastiastu, everyone. Thank you, Gamalan Sakadaya, for inviting me and putting on this really awesome series and uh, really fortunate to be a part of it. The first two lectures are awesome. Um, the artists are very inspiring and makes me very nervous to be doing anything after them. <laughs> um, but today we're supposed to be moderated by Morissa Dorn, who um, is a member of Gamelan Skarjaya, and I've known her since um, working with her at CalArts uh, when I was down there doing my master's at UCSD in San Diego, actually. But Marissa, unfortunately, cannot make it today because there are spreading wildfires literally at her doorstep. So she has evacuated herself, um, and hopefully she's okay and safe. Uh, we got that she got out of there 
um, safely, but she's obviously dealing with a lot of things as is a lot of people right now. The clouds are smoky. Uh, Denver is not an exception. Um, but uh, Rebecca has been awesome and step is going to step in for uh, to be moderator for for this talk today. So thank you again, Rebecca. Um, and if you don't have anything else to say, I can continue. Sure. Um, all right. So I guess I'll just give the floor to you. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. So these are also always so strange because the webinar format on Zoom or any uh, streaming platform is weird because it feels like I'm just talking to myself. But thank you all for using the chat function and letting us know that we're not talking into the void. Um, I speak into the void and to myself quite often. So it doesn't, uh, it's nice to be talking to people. Um, I saw a question there, Andrea, I cannot see you but um, hopefully you have a question at the end. So I'll just sort of get into it. Today will be really fun and hopefully um, we learn something and uh, empathize with the, the sort of the plight of uh, Indonesian and especially Balinese artists in the United States and outside of Indonesia. Um, untuk teman-teman yang uh, di Indonesia, maaf ya uh, pakai bahasa Inggris nih. Bahasa saya udah Udah lama nggak pakai uh, bahasa Indo, nggak ada teman-teman di sini. Biasanya pakai uh, bahasa Bali aja, bahasa Bali kasar sama sama Bapak. <laughs> so, I was just making an apology for the Indonesian speaking audience for speaking English. Um, and obviously, logat saya, uh, logat Bali, Colorado. <laughs> so, uh, bear, bear with me. Um, so, today, I'll be talking about one of my pieces here um, that I transposed from a genre of music called math metal, or more commonly for me, and more specific to my research and my interests, something called math core. All right. Um, these topics I've been dealing with for a really long time and really interested in, so it's 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 fun for me to talk about, and and I think they're important topics, even though uh, some people might not. Um, but it is a fairly vulnerable space for me. So at any point, if I get emotional, I apologize. But these kinds of musics and the communities that are playing and created surrounding them are some of the most vibrant and awesome. Um, and I know I'm sounding a little ethnocentric right now, but it, I, I, I'm advocating and overtly protective of Indonesian communities, especially outside of Indonesia. Um, so how I want to uh, frame this talk today before we get into listening to some of the music and taking, taking apart or deconstructing the, the transposition I made, um, is I'm borrowing a concept from a scholar named Jeremy Wallach, who has done um, countless studies on Indonesian popular music and is a seminal figure in ethnomusicology, musicology, um, popular music studies. Um, and this term that he uses, which I don't actually believe is published, but he um, responded to one of my uh, presentations in the past with this term, and that is refusion. All right, so here, my trusty card. Hopefully you can see that, hopefully it's not backwards like it is for me. Um, but this term refusion, so I want you to notice that there's a hyphen in between re and fusion, all right? So the reason I'm doing this is because this is a very loaded term for um, myself and how Pat Jeremy sort of explained it from his, his end. Um, and the, the reason I want to frame this talk around this term is because it is a refusing, so literally a refusing of math metal for Balaganju, right? So we're as a fusion music, which I'll explain in a second, math core as a fusion music, I'm recontextualizing and reforming into another idiom that I'm more closely familiar with, which is Balaganju, right? So that's one use of the term refusing. Another Another use is refusing Balinese identity. So constantly having to reformulate, especially as a Balinese person, 
first generation Balinese person in the United States, constantly having to refuse or reorient my Balineseness in different contexts. But also there is a refusal of complacency, right? A refusal to stay boxed in, a refusal to stay pigeonholed um, and not just say, oh, who do you just plays gamelan? Or, oh, who do you just plays heavy metal music? And to be boxed in is fun at times, but it shouldn't be the sole identity of, of anyone, right? And especially people dealing with multiple identities um, simultaneously, all right? Um, and so as we're going through thinking and listening and experiencing the abrasive boisterousness that is to come, uh, I want you to think about this idea of refusing, whether it pertains personally to you, um, but especially for um, these sort of first generation Balinese people in the United States and maybe spread out across the globe because there really aren't that many of us. And um, as I will talk about later on, sometimes it's hard to have therapy sessions or talk about it with people just because every uh, Balinese person in the United States is so different um, and diverse. And that's, you know, that's a testament to how diverse Bali is in itself in Indonesia and how complicated things are. Um, so that's the idea of refusion, all right? Refusing um, music and refusing identities, fusion as in uh, an intertwinedness um, and fusion and refusal as uh, not wanting to be necessarily held down, right? So the piece that we'll be looking at today, I have titled uh, Banen Mua, which is Balinese for Fix Your Face, which is the title of the Dillinger Escape Plan tune, the math metal tune that I transposed um, to Balaganjur. And it is an incidental um, title. I, I titled it after Fix Your Face, but this idea of Banen Mua, actually, I've heard it a few times when I was younger, whether by parents or other people in villages in Banga, it's not a very, very commonly said phrase or term, right? So here it is, banen mu, all right? So literally, fix face. Um, so what it means to me and how I've sort of thought about it is that it is a momentary um, reorienting and biting of the tongue and reorienting your identity to fit the situation, all right? So for example, I'm a, I'm a kid running around the house and I want to play and things like that and my parents have guests coming over or something like that, right? And parents are realizing, oh, the kids are a little too crazy right now. We need to um, just calm down a minute just so we can be good hosts and have um, the guests be comfortable for when they come, you know? So as you can imagine, as a child, it's really hard to like just turn off your chaos and um, try and subdue your emotions a little bit, all right? So that is what I'm uh, describing as a sort of a fixing your face. So fixing your identity and your um, initial affective uh, experience to fit the context at hand, right? Now think about this for not only Balinese, native Balinese musicians in the United States, but also for a lot of uh, musicians that have found refuge um, away from their homeland, right? At that point, they're, they're more or less in this country surviving in some capacity. They're always having to reorient their identity to fit the, the context at hand, which is, you know, a very Desa Kalapatra, um, philosophy, right? Time, place, context, philosophy. Um, but there, there hasn't been much of a point, and, and I've seen this with many groups and many teachers in the United States, where the, the ideas inside them, their, their, their sort of initial Balinese-ness, has ne is never going to be realized fully, right? It's never, the sounds in their head, the compositional methods in their head, they're never going to be um, heard in the U.S. as as they hear it known to them, right? Their Balinese-ness, and that's something that that a lot of teachers have 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 uh, have 
been stable with, right? They, they come, they've come to terms with that. It's just different people's different contexts and things like that. But it still is, at least to me, sometimes a little sad when, when, when there's all these very artistic people and we have to teach beginning gamelan every semester to, to, to newcomers, which is an awesome thing in itself, right? But anyway, so this is the idea of Banan Moa is sort of having to bite your tongue for community, right? For the greater good of the community at hand, not having an initial impulse to, <laughs> to be Balinese necessarily. So that's Banan Moa. So as we're going on here, um, I, I want to briefly, and I'm sorry if I'm going so fast, I know we're, we're short on time, but um, I'm going to briefly tell you what MathCore is. It's a um, fusion or a genre of heavy metal that fuses sort of the late 80s hardcore music and, um, and beyond um, with the same era of punk music, right? So math core. And as you can imagine, the math side of it tends to do, deal with the different time signatures and the asymmetry of it all and the very abrasiveness of um, this music. Um, so I found it very fitting that Bala Ganjur was the sort of uh, Indonesian parallel to it, at least in, in for my sensibilities, right? So I want us to listen to the piece by the Dillinger Escape Plan first. It's called Fix Your Face. For some of you, this may be very loud and abrasive. Actually, for all of you, it should be, but it might be hard to hear. Um, it will be loud uh, and very overwhelming, but what I want you to listen to specifically, a little bit of guided listening here, is the rhythms. Try and find a pulse to it, because there is a pulse to the madness. Um, but also just sort of the organized chaos of it and especially the work of the voice. Um, so Rebecca, if you could play Fix Your Face for us, and it's about two and a half minutes long, we're going to listen to its entire Thank you. Awesome. Nice, soothing spiritual music for your yoga festival. Um, Great. <laughs> Hopefully that was enjoyable for some of you. And thank you, Tante Carla, for uh, putting the lyrics up there. We won't be doing a full lyrical analysis here, but I will make a comment about it later on. So as you can hear, hopefully, or as you've noticed, it is, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of distorted guitars. There's a lot of um, very clouded, uh, some might call noise, noise music, right? Um, but there's a method to the madness, right? It's all very precise and, and um, there's rhythmic complexity in which to sort of get this, I, this flow of mathiness, right? It's not necessarily that they're counting time signatures or anything like that, but there's a, a, a through composed um, essence to it, right? Something that doesn't necessarily repeat throughout. Okay, um, so that's the piece that I was working with that I was really into for a really long time. And I'll just um, ex uh, share a small anecdote. When I first started this project, which was actually 2011, and I first showed this to my father, we were listening to it on the way to Gamelan Tunas Makar rehearsal. And I put it on for him thinking that he'd like it because in my head, I was like, this is totally Balagandu. He was not... Uh, Pervy to it, he did not like it at all. He, it was, it was very not uh, to his Javanese gamelan, Balinese gamelan sensibilities. But interestingly enough, when I when I was going to present this uh, in 2018 at Cornell, I played it for him again, and he had kind of forgotten that what this piece was. And we listened to it, and his initial response, without being prompted was, hey, this is really good for Balagandra. You should try doing this thing. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's really interesting that uh, we've spent time with, with, with this identity and like going on and he, he can see the value in it now. Um, so now we're going to watch and listen to the uh, refused version um, played on Gamelan Balagandur. Um, and this is performed by Gamelan Tunas Makar in Denver, who I grew up with. And we learned this whole piece over a weekend, so just two days. 
I, I sent the parts before that and they, they got to practice it on their own, but we put it together in two days um, in, a, in a thing that they called boot camp. It's a play off boot camp, terrible joke. Anyway, it was a really intense time um, for that, that weekend of learning this piece and we, we recorded it um, a few times. But this performance that we're going to watch was the first public performance um, at a jazz club in Denver, Colorado, a very famous jazz club called Dazzle. So Rebecca, can we watch Banin Moa at Dazzle, please? And Rebecca will put the links to the YouTube. So, cause it will be choppy for a little bit for some of us, but you can have a more clear view if you save the link. did such a good job, didn't they? <laughs> to know some far is awesome. Um, cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I can tell by some of the comments you put in that. Uh, it, was, uh, fun. it was a fun project to do and not just fun, it was necessary for, for, for um, not only to get out my artistic expression, but also to confront my own hypocrisies, my own um, uh, difficulties of, of being a very privileged Balinese American person um, and dealing with the interiority of, of all of these things and what better way than to play really loud music right um, and playing metals together um, so as you have noticed I'm sure um, it's very boisterous and noisy and is intended to be an abrasive kind of music, right? So there's an Indonesian term that many scholars have alluded to and have talked about in the, in the past, uh, but not a lot of people have used it as a, as a sort of framework, right? So I'm attempting to do that a little bit here, and that is the term rame, right? So rame, sometimes spelled ramai, okay? So this idea here is a, an affective, uh, sort of a noise as comfort affect, right? So things that are boisterous are actually more comfortable 
for your community community rather than things that are silent, which tend to be a little more ominous or uh, evil evil sort of energy lurking around. Um, so I use this ramenis to not only build our community and bring us tighter in together, but to sort of deal with the frustrations of not being able to have some of the things that is are in my head compositionally realized in the tangible world, right? Um, a lot of what I do with the composition here is that there's an, uh, an element of traditionalism that is where we are more or less using gamelan balagandra instruments, right? Um, with the rayong being the samaradana specifically. So you have two extra pitches, um, then you would a uh, gong Um And then there's an element of, of really stuck rhythms, right? Thing. And then there's actually, in, in this piece, there's an element of improvisation. And that is the, the boisterousness at the, in the middle there where people were screaming, right? So there's a phenomenon in Balagandra and Bali right now where they're, Balinese, uh, Balaganja groups will, in a competitive state, they'll add singing to it, like actual singing to Balaganja, which isn't a common thing or hasn't been for a few years. Usually when in the traditional context of Balaganja, in ceremonious context, you will play for a ceremony such as a cremation ceremony, Naben, or Mataru, where you're cleansing the space, where you're building a new, um, uh, uh architectural something right whether it's a house or reorienting land you cleanse the space and in these moments or even for Ngrupo, right the day before the day of silence in bali um, where you're intending to make so much noise um in these contexts you hear m a lot more yelling a lot more screaming right because you're 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 trying to appease darkness and i want to be clear here when i say at any point when i say darkness in this presentation I'm not alluding to anything negative at all. What I'm alluding specifically to is this uh, Balinese idea of niskala, all right? Or the intangible, all right? The, the area, the occult uh, realm in which we can't necessarily see it or feel it, but it is, uh, it dictates a lot of how we traverse the, the physical and tangible selves, right? So this singing in, in Balagandru, I, I kind of, I just, I personally don't like it, but you know, it, it, it provides community and it's, it's very enticing for, for people, for a lot of uh, the Balagandru groups in Bali right now. But for this piece, I wanted to can, to keep the, the screaming in there because it's, um, I wouldn't say it's more visceral, but it's, it's, uh, it's still jarring in a way that's different use of the vocal of of the voice than than singing right a little more akin to appeasing darkness in bali all right um so let me just get my bearings here and check time okay have some time here so as you can imagine i'm not only today talking about composing music but i'm also talking about composing the balinese identity um, in the United States as, um, as myself, right? And so this is, uh, tends to be a, a little bit of an autoethnography, um, backed up by research that other people have done in ethnomusicology, but also by the Balinese community that I've talked to, at least from my generation in the United States, right? And this, these projects are kind of inherently political, but not outwardly so. They're, I'm deal we're dealing with internal politics that we have to on our own, right? Just because there's no real source outside of it, just because of how different we are, which is awesome. But also um, there's, uh, there's not a large community of Indonesians in the United States. And you know, I also recognize that the Indonesians in the United States, there was no forced migration, right? There was no real, um, exodus from Indonesia to the United States for necessarily for violence or anything like that, right? We, for, for the most part, we had a choice to be here um, and, and, and uh, create our, our, our identities through this. Nonetheless, we still have to deal with being Balinese. Um, and for a lot of us that live here, we are fortunate to be able to go back and forth 
pre-COVID, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's kept a lot of us in a liminal space, right? Like when people ask, oh, where do you like being better? Or which, which place do you like being better? It feels like we're having to rip apart our identities and our souls a little bit. It's like, okay, yeah, of course, I obviously like being in Bali. I obviously like being in the United States, right? Um, but it's a simultaneous existence, right? It's not just that I turn off my Balinese and then be American for a little bit and vice versa. So um, with these, all these things in mind, the terms cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation come, come to the foreground, right? And I've, these are things that a lot of us have dealt with for a really long time, but also um, there's, I don't think there's a real answer to it yet. We're, we're working through it. Uh, this is the way I personally deal with it, is to create really abrasive music. And I, I, I will say that what is so enticing about these kinds of projects is that I often, you know, in the university system or elsewhere, often get asked by other people, because Bali is such a hot touristy area, like often get asked, uh, where to go or like what to do in Bali and things like this right and very very stereotypical uh, questions and and things like that um, but a large majority of people going there are sometimes at least that I've spoken to are going there for like yoga festivals and looking for really calming spiritual music and then when I play for them Balaganjur they're like oh that's not very calming or spiritual I'm like well it actually is because we're 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 playing a music in which we're dealing with darkness and appeasing darkness in a way that's very beautiful and that I haven't really heard anywhere uh, else just um, dis describe the 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 necessity for musics like Balagandu, right? Um, like I was just talking to m my partner Ayu, who some of you saw present last week, and just hearing her talk about why and other people um but why balaganju is like necessary for for a community is is really it's it's hard to say it's it's just a beautiful thing to to hear people talk about noise in this way and boisterousness and talking about um this thing that conventionally means that you should be marginalized or that people don't necessarily want but here's a community that understands that noise is important and darkness exists and evil spirits ex exist and these realms exist but we have to acknowledge these things right and i think that's what a gamelan group outside of indonesia especially in the united states can do for a lot of people um i have critiques about that myself but i promised a lot of people that i <laughs> i keep calm today um but it could be for a further conversation um and these are the things that uh, just kind of continuously and infinitely go on in the head right so to wrap everything together when we're, we're dealing with math core the musicians of math core, if you ever get a chance to talk to them or if you are one yourself, it's a very, they talk about playing the music from a very personal and interior and internal struggle kind of place. A place where you're fuming inside and there's things that you don't understand that you have to deal with yourself. For Balaganjur, we're dealing with darkness in a different way, right? We're appeasing the dark energy that exists um, and evil spirits and what's called the Bhutakala, right? Which isn't necessarily a negative entity, but we're appeasing Bhutakala to uh, not disrupt certain ceremonies so we can uh, cleanse the space or things like that. So when you put these musics together, it's, it is, it does seem ostensibly juxtaposing because one, you're dealing with the harboring of darkness and the other ones, you're kind of barring it out away from where you want to be. But it's in a space in which the affective component in the practice and the music um, integral that play this and that um, 
see this as a, a very vital thing to human cosmology in Bali, Indonesia. With that, um, I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to uh, stop talking and open it up to questions. Thank you so much for being here and uh, listening to my rant. Um, if you didn't notice already, I was nervous, so I popped open a beer. Sorry if that was unprofessional, but again, necessary. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rebecca. You're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It was really, really interesting. And I'm sure it must have raised a lot of questions. I'm already seeing a hand up from Phil Cox. Um, so please, if you do have any questions for Pudu, please um, put up your hand with that raise hand function. Um, and I'll get to all of you in the order that, um, in the order that you raised your hands. Be gentle. <laughs> so go ahead, Phil. <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. That was great. Um, super good. Um, I have I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, speaking to the um, to the 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 cultural identity uh, um, that you were talking about, the, the the being kind of caught between your Balinese ness and your being part of the metal scene. Um, do you think there's a resistance in the Balinese and Javanese metal community to um, adapting or using traditional forms like kateka, drum patterns, scale, scale modes, tuning, stuff like that um, in, in metal music? Um, I, and there's, you know, I've heard a, like a few bands from Bali, like e Eternal Madness, they, they used the Dalong on one of their records and it was great. Um, Burger Kill from Dempasar, they, they've, they've like messed around with some Kotec on guitar stuff. Um, <laughs> pardon my French, but Total Asshole, another punk band from, from uh, uh, Dempasar, they, they've used Balaganjar um, uh, in live settings, um, I've heard, and on one of their, their early cassette tape um, to lead into the show, um, like basically a seamless transition between Balaganjar and punk. Um, uh, Mayat, another Balinese band, used um, like traditional kind of Bali Aga imagery and like ritual sacrifice on stage as part of their act. But it doesn't seem like there, there's been a lot of Bal like Balinese or Indonesian metal bands that have um, utilized formal compositional elements from, from traditional music um, as like a base structure, it always seems to be kind of like a like a a feature sprinkled on top. Um, do you think that's that's a, a conscious thing, a, like a rebel a rebellion against like traditional cultural norms, or or uh, yeah, I guess that's my question. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, totally. Uh, hope to answer it. Sort of, <laughs> um, but what I can say for from the the my friends and communities that I worked with specifically specifically in Bali, one person comes to mind right now. His name is he goes under by the name of Monotheist Dilema, which is like monotheistic person, but very crass way of saying it, right? Um, but he he's very much in the metal scene as a pedagogue of. Balinese gamelan specifically. So I think there's still a large separation, at least musically, that like, oh, this is death metal or math core or whatever, and this is gamelan over here. And attempts to fuse them, the only real band I've heard using just like tonal modal things is Eternal Madness. Um, otherwise, it does play to kind of a stereotypical metal, you want to be bigger and badder than the next band, so let's see what kind of kitschy things we can put in at, in terms of imagery, right? But it's not as trivial as that. I think for a lot of these bands, especially in Bali, it's a way, and this is something I'm working on if I ever finish my PhD, um, it's a way for indigenous peoples of Bali to reclaim their identity 
through popular musics and through sort of what would be called modern musics, right? Musics that have um, sort of made its way into to Indonesia in, in, through popular idioms. So uh, for, for at least the communities that I'm working with, I don't know that there's much of a resistance, primarily because the people that are playing Balinese gamelan, at least the ones I've talked to, the people that are playing Balinese gamelan are some of the people also playing heavy metal and it's not a it's not a rejection of tradition in a way it's just another activity in which to claim their balinese right so with that being said I, ha I really haven't heard anyone integrating kotekan to the extent that actually a lot of like americans or people in england have i have a friend uh luke who is from, lives in Manchester, England, who I actually did a, my master's thesis on. Um, and he has a band called Niskala, and he actively fuses Balaganjur with heavy metal. And he's really the only one I'm do, I've heard do it effectively. <laughs> um, but that, that has a whole host of topics to talk about too. So I don't know that I can ans sufficiently answer your question, but apart from what I just said, sorry. That that was great. Um, uh, another another uh, one. You, you know, you're talking about the the concept of darkness not being a negative uh, aspect in in uh, Balinese culture. Um, uh, I think that in a lot of ways, the metal scene, especially the more extreme subgenres like black metal and and like grindcore and and some of that stuff. Um, the, the people in those scenes are some of the most positive, nicest, friendliest, best humans I've ever met. Um, Likewise. And speak, it, yeah, it seems to, to, um, to go back to um, uh, this quote that I read from Vasily Kandinsky, that Ger the German abstract expressionist painter years ago that stuck with me. And uh, to paraphrase, he said, um, any art form that fails to uh, to recognize the negative aspects of human existence is in effect stillborn. And I think that really plays a, a lot um, towards uh, the dark, like actually addressing the darkness in, in compositions, in music as sort of a catharsis, an outlet to, to get um, those negative, those negative um, aspects of existence out of yourself in a non-destructive way. Um, do you do you think that 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 that's valid for 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 your for your compositional viewpoint of of using that that kind of darkness? I I totally think so. And whether this translated to Vamalan Tunis Makar, who played this with me, um, is is another conversation. But at least for myself, a lot of the motivation for doing this was you know there there are so many things that happen in Bali that are just kind of in, embedded in in traditional village life where you acknowledge things that you normally wouldn't or in in the US or something like that and it's something that I just really wanted to have people experience at least a little bit you're not going to get the full effect of course but at least be able to experience the exhaustion of Balaganjur um, the the sort of intensity in which you have to um, get play this music for a, a dark entity in some way, right? And one thing that I didn't mention when we when we were recording this actually uh, over the poop camp, the two day uh, session, um, a community member that had played gamelan not with Tenas Makar but with another Denver group um, had passed away, and he was a really big uh, member of the community in the improvisation and experimental arts in Colorado. And we played, we didn't play Balaganjur, but we played for his uh, sort of commemoration um, event. And it was all around this time. And it was really interesting that we, it happened on this weekend that we were really pulling this piece together. And so whether they recognized it or not, it, it was, it, we were dealing with a darkness um, that needed to be appeased, right? And that's, that's the thing that I personally think about often, but uh, to to sort of try and 
realize that in a larger community is is something that I, I think is valid and valuable, hopefully. Thanks. That that was that was excellent. Uh, Anna, on a, on a on a passing note, um, you should check out the new Kralis album. It just just dropped like a week or two ago. It's really really cool. amazing. You would love it. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll check it out. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Phil. Um, next in line, we have a question from Ibu Diane Bracken. Hello, Ibu. <laughs> Uh, you might still be on mute. Okay. Uh, salamat malam. Uh, salamat malam. This is probably a really basic question, but it didn't come up in the beginning when you were talking about trying to integrate yourself. Are you Balinese American or are you someone from Bali living here now? Yeah, good question. That is something that I often forget to tell people. <laughs> uh, so good question. Um, I, I actually was born in Solo, in Surakarta, but my, my father is Balinese, um, and my mother is Javanese, and my stepmother is Balinese. Um, so I've, I've spent more time being Balinese than not. I tr my family moved to the United States when I was seven months old, so... I basically was born in the air in some capacity. <laughs> and I'm glad my dad's not here to talk about all the embarrassing stories of me as a child. But um, we've been here for the larger portion of 30 years in Colorado. We started in San Diego. Um, but we go back to Bali or we try to uh, every summer or every winter, every December, um, whether it's for temple ceremonies or uh, my dad along with... Uh, an ethnomusicologist named Liz Macy have a, a, a global sangar called Mane Gale, um, where we bring college students to our compound and study Balinese things. <laughs> okay, so I would declare you're basically Balinese American. <laughs> All right, thank you. For the like I'm German American, you know, my mother came here and, but that's what I am. I'm American first. So thank you. And Rob, thank you. Thanks, Ibu Diane. Um, so next, we have a question from um, Shayla James. Um, who, Ibu or Bapa, Shayla, I think Ibu. I'm going to, um, you said you were, wanted to share your video, and I've just figured out how to do this. So, oh no, um, Shayla, nothing embarrassing. No. Oh yeah, what up? Hey! <laughs> no. Oh, it's good to see you. You too. Uh, <laughs> You're making me nervous. Oh no, don't be nervous. I loved the beer can. Like it's just in the corner here. I loved it, and then you drank perfect. it. I was like, perfect. <laughs> So first I'd like to say like, thank you for sharing, you know, your words, thoughts, um, yourself. Um, hey, Andrea, <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> and um, I mean, I guess I have uh, now two questions. First is, um, would you identify as um, Balinese American? Mm. Oh, did I freeze? I, I would. Um... No, you, your, your face froze, your voice didn't. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I would identify as Bonnie's American, though in, in these times, in especially 2020, I gravitate toward my Balinese-ness a little more. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm weirdly, not weirdly, I'm upset at the American side a little bit. And we won't talk about that, but <laughs> you, can, you can make the conjecture for yourself why. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. No, uh, I but I, 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just wanted to ask that because I don't want an identity. You know, you should feel comfortable with whatever identity that you you have. Um, and then my next one is it's it's a simple one, but um, do you have a call to action for us or to 
the communities that you serve? Um, is there something that we can do on behalf of you or something um, you think that we could benefit from in helping you, supporting you? Call to action. <laughs> sure. Call to action. I, I was anticipating this question and I knew you were going to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, I actually don't have a very good call to action. My, my only thing is I can respond to that with certain experiences with trying to get land acknowledgements said at the beginning of performances for certain groups um, that I've been a part of and sometimes met with resistance because some community members don't see the value and see it being overtly politicized, which I totally understand, right? But as you've seen in a Balinese performance, whether it's at a university or whatever, at the beginning of performance, someone goes out in front and blesses the stage, right? There's an offering, you hit the gong, there's some kind of prayer involved. If that's not akin to a land acknowledgement, then what is? So it's like, it's really weird for me to have people in a group that, yeah, okay, we're all diverse and it's great to be different people and stuff like that. But there are obvious things within, especially within a Balinese gamelan that maybe you should think about that might be conducive to like why a Balinese gamelan exists in the United States, right? So I don't know, you know, at this point, gamelan in outside of Indonesia isn't just an Indonesian identity, right? there's this has obviously created really vibrant communities in the united states and in england and um all over right and it, it's not so for better for worse it has been co-opted a little bit but but i can't i can't take away the community aspect of that because that's something i promote but something that i can't sit still with is that when you participate in a musical activity that might or may or may not be your own and then you don't acknowledge some of the we don't even have to call it a traditional context right some of the contextual things that go along with it such as what i said earlier about like some people that i've talked to saying that balagandra isn't a spiritual music right just because it's loud and, sh and stuff i almost cussed i thought there's some children um anyway, anyway but it's like no this is like according to Balinese people, one of the most spiritual things you can do. <laughs> it's, it's like really strange. So like, I, I, I think at least with, with Gamelan, people should be able to uh, experience it, whether they play it or hear it or and create community with it. But just like acknowledge where this began and like where it came from. It's, as artistic expression, things always change, right? Gamelan today isn't like it was uh, even like five years ago or in the past, right? So the idea of traditionalism is always changing. We always think about traditions as being this, this ob objectified thing in the past, right? That we have to hold on to like this when we don't, we don't necessarily think about it changing. It's traditions change, right? Your things like that. So I think the biggest call to action is like attempting to acknowledge it in a way that is productive for your community or the musicians you're playing with, something like that, right? Um, yeah, it's the best I got right now. <laughs> oh, that's great. I got you, bro. On it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Good seeing you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much, Bushela. Um, next, we have a question from Pat Clarence. Um, Clarence is, is a musician in Sukarjaya. Um, and I hear from Clarence that he would like to share his video, um, and I'm going to allow him to do that. Oh, thank you. So good to see you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I am no puck whatsoever, but I'll accept <laughs> it. Um, I'm going to, I'm sorry if I, my, my niece and my best friend were over, so I was a little distracted here during your lecture, um, and you, you, may, you may have covered this already, um, and my, my question is, akin to Shayla's question, but in terms of, uh, in terms of like being Balinese American, however, however you identify um, and, and seeing a bunch of like, I guess, American gamelan, what do you want to see from American gamelan, especially from gamelan who, um, uh, who like, 
I mean, the, what, what I'm going to say is going to be very specific who I'm talking about, but like Gamelan who may invite like Balinese musicians and might not have someone who um, has like a specific like Balinese American person leading us or something like that. Um, what, 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 what kind of music do you want to see? What do you want to see us, us do? Kind of things like that. I think that's a, you know, that's a really awesome question and a very loaded and complex one that I don't foresee myself being able to answer necessarily because one, because music in many idioms is a very subjective thing, whether that subject is a person or multiple persons, right? So I think you do the music that feels right to your community, right? Which is a, a, akin to Gamelan in Bali, like the village even five kilometers away is going to have very different repertoire and different approach to it. And it, maybe even different instruments, right? Not everyone's going to have a gong or, and the nice thing actually about Balagan or in Bali right now is it's one of the most affordable kinds of music and gamelan in Bali right now. So a lot more villages are able to, to at least have a Balagan group, which is awesome. Um, but in terms of what I want to see in uh, a group in the US, I think it just kind of goes back to the acknowledgement thing. Um, whether you're playing traditional repertoire, Samarco Gulagan repertoire today, or you're making contemporary pieces that don't have any formal formula to it, I think what should be shown at least is a, a, a tight knit community and a, the like concept of gotong royong, right? Like communal work, seeing that everyone has their, knows their part and like making it an efficient community. And it really does come out. It seems that we may have actually lost our presenter momentarily. Oh, I thought that was my internet. <laughs> um, indigenous methods. Let's use BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous people of color um, methods that they used in formatting our dissertations or our presentations. Can I pause, can I pause you for a second? <laughs> yeah. Your, your internet cut out for like, a, a literal like 15 seconds and oh, no. you, what you what where it unfroze you were saying something that I want to hear but I want to hear what happened before it <laughs> okay what was the last thing you heard <laughs> I you said BIPOC and my ears like rang and then and then I don't know what you said before that sure okay so what I, what I was saying was that the frustrations I have sometimes are that there's always a call from mainly from at least some academics that, you know, we should be listening to BIPOC people and listening to indigenous peoples and listening to people of color and using how they want to present things and how they want to um, do things as a, as a method into how we should be thinking about things. But then in moments where that does happen, then it's like, oh, the larger masses of white culture don't necessarily understand what that means. So can you please reformulate what you know to do to fit our knowledge of how we should be thinking about things. And so that's, that's a, if that makes sense, that's a big frustration for me. Um, because that's been a large portion of my own life where I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm learning things. I don't know everything and I don't plan to know everything constantly learning. Right. But, um, there are certain things I do know how to do. And when you ask me to sort of reformulate this thing that I, that I know how to do to fit, um, how, to better, how to better serve a community that may or may not even appreciate it, then like, I don't know, that's not a, a road I really wanna go down and it's really frustrating. So um, that went farther than I thought, but. <laughs> Hopefully, it is of substance to your question. <laughs> no, you went you went as deep as I wanted you to go. Actually, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Clarence. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, uh, next up, we have questions from uh, Ibu Andrea 
and um, Lisa Lim after that. And now also, oh, that hand also went down. So we've got two <laughs> questions in line. Okay, cool. Ibu Andrea. Oh my gosh, look at that. You're muted. Okay, okay, hi. Can you see me, hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hey, all right, good to see you. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for those last two great questions. I don't want to take up too much time. I know we're running out, but that those are exactly the kind of stuff I was hoping to hear about because you know me, I was just kind of thrown into this teacher position. Can you still hear me? It looks frozen. Uh oh, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but I'm going to ask just in case um, about the, the landmark recognition. Okay, good, thank you. Um, I kind of would like to know specifically if there's anything you could tell me about um, anything specific I can do before a performance for my students, you know, um, as far as uh, a land recognition. Sorry, Andrea, you you were also frozen and it might have been me, but I didn't hear a single word you said. <laughs> oh, darn it. Okay, I think, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Sorry, I don't want to take too much time, so I'm just going to rush through. Um, I, I really appreciate the topic, exactly what I'm hoping to learn more about, especially being thrown into the teacher position on accident. <laughs> um, I, is there anything specific you can suggest for me, um, for my students, before I have my students perform as far as, um, I, I forgot, what did you call it, land recognition? Sure, and I, I want to be clear that land acknowledgements in this country specifically deal with indigenous peoples of the Americas, um, Canada, uh, Mexico, this, this region, right, and have specific things to do with uh, the reorientation of geographic land and the, re and the power differentials of peoples in this country specifically. So when I say land acknowledgement in that context, if that's what it means, right? Okay. But for, for you, and I know we, we worked all many years together and have uh, established rapport <laughs> and good job taking on a, uh, the teaching roles that we left you with, which I think you're doing a great job with. I keep up with the museum school every now and again. Um, but I think, honestly, I think you're doing exactly what needs to be doing for especially for kids that are in kindergarten and in charter schools right where that is you're getting them to play first you're getting them to understand the idea of community first right um that we can come together playing music for a particular cause from there and i've seen you do this in the past you've always acknowledged that this is music from bali right and like when some kid goes, oh, namaste, you go, oh no, that's not, that's not Bali, that's a different place, right? Just kind of over, <laughs> like, them in, in different ways, right? Um, so, and the, the community it produces outside of your school is, is awesome, and it's, it's something that's very small, but important and integral to that part of San Diego. Um, and hopefully for the larger community of children's gamelan outside of it as well. So I don't have much to say or critique about what you're doing <laughs> other than you got to stop calling that thing a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Just a piece of metal. <laughs> I do tell them, I do tell them that it's not, uh, dragons are more like Chinese culture or something. It's not really as much as Indonesian culture. Well, dragons <laughs> too. Yeah, I see. I still have so much to learn. I don't know anything. <laughs> Thank well, you so much. We'll have a session. Thanks, Andrea. Good seeing you. You too. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and next up, we have a question from uh, Lisa Lim. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> Hello. Hear me? Hello. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Putu, and um, the organization for organizing this. My name is Lisa, and um, I live in the Bay Area. I have heard about um, the group, but I have not been able to find time to participate in 
the activity. Um, however, uh, because of my personal ident identity, I'm from um, immigrant from Malaysia of Chinese descent, mm -hmm. and the closest culture that I've been able to feel at home is the Gamelan culture. Mm -hmm. And Ibu here too, actually, who's um, um, my friend. And, um, and then the Javanese culture is also cross with the Johor culture, which is where I'm from. So a lot of this Southeast Asian culture, as, uh, as, I, as I expose myself more um, to other Southeast Asians who are part of the diaspora, I'm learning a lot more, a lot more of the nuances of how we become who we are today as this umbrella term of being Asian American. <laughs> Yeah. So going back to your point of um, feeling that burden of representation, it's like, okay, I want to share with you. But then in the end, it becomes like a backlash of like the whole idea yeah. of inclusion. Like, oh, but where do I start when the, the idea of Gotong Royong, for example, mm. like, is like an entire thesis. Um, right. <laughs> so, so my question, uh, my question is, what is the easiest way that you have found, um, based on your experience, to be able to link to the dominant culture in America as a general, um, in terms of the identity um, as who you see you are? using words as opposed to using music because yeah yeah, yeah. that's what i find very difficult to express totally i i'm with you there and i commend you on even being able to think these things through because it's it's a bur it's heavy right they're heavy things to deal with and it's him oh Sorry, he froze a little bit. Oh no! Um, seems like we're we're losing connection with Putu, which is really unfortunate because it's a really just... incredible question. Oh, I think it's back. Sorry. Oh me. yeah, we lost you for a second. Oh no! <laughs> what what was the last thing you heard me say? I don't think we, uh, right at the beginning. Okay, I'll just start again. So I, I said thank you for that. And it's a really, it's a very commendable that you're even able to think these things through, right? Because they are very heavy and they can be a burden to think, or think through on your own. Um, I think, I don't know that I can answer the easiest way of explaining my Indonesianness, other than at times for a lot of, my friends and for myself who are under the larger umbrella of Asian American, we kind of feel like ghosts, right? We feel like we exist in a space, but we have to just sit there and be quiet and just mm -hmm. survive, right? And unfortunately, I haven't found personally a good way to talk about this with words, but my musical expression is where I live is where mm -hmm. I really get out these things that are building up inside myself and the things that I see with um, the sort of orang tua or the, the, my, my parental figures in the Indonesian community in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I apologize for not being able to give you a good easy way out, but that's, that's unfortunately, it's, it's been very ghost-like at times, just like wandering the streets and being like, hey, I think I exist, but I'm not sure because you're not paying attention. <laughs> well, like, so. What type of ghosts? And then you have different categories of ghosts too. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, cheers, I'm thinking too. Awesome, um, yeah, right. Everybody. And <laughs> so then now, um, and, and, and this is probably a greater question to uh, people who are, in, who, are, who are here listening as well. Um, one one question I have is I I'm I'm interdisciplinary um, I mathematics like you know I, I had an engineering background and also um, 
a music technology background in, in harp of other mu music instruments. So I'm at a place where, because of the, the confusion, I, I, I stopped playing my music because of that burden. Like, okay, and then we are so segregated that I feel like the harp doesn't even belong to me anymore and I don't feel comfortable playing it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have that feeling like, oh, well, this whole East and West, this whole, do you feel like the fetish, fetishizing of the Asian culture or the Orientalism, the exoticness? Yeah. How do you handle that? Um, oh. It's like through, uh, uh, through a Western instrument or medium. Yeah, okay. That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, and it is definitely a thing that I was talking about earlier, right? Where, especially in academia, where I grew up playing gamelan and this thing that's been my life or a part, not only, it's been a, a faction, a large portion of the identity, right? But mm. people academifying it becomes, now it becomes this thing that is your life is now a career. And it's, it's a right. thing that becomes monetized in this way or something, not necessarily right. commodified or you can go down that road, but, um, it, I totally get that. I had moments where I was in, I was in university and I was like, I, sh am I allowed to be playing music? Like, it doesn't seem like academia wants me to keep playing music. Right. And so the way I've sort of been able to traverse those things are presentations like this, where I explain that through my musical practice that I'm not going to get rid of no matter what, um, mm. I can talk about it with a new lexicon or with a different, terminology that is slightly more academic but not so jargony right like right we don't have to make people confused about it and we, we can still have conversations um where it's more or less clear in some ways but that's the best way that i could do it i it's i and that's why i went into graduate school is to try and have different perspectives on how to play the music that I love doing. And so through Western instruments, I'm, I'm also a drum set player, right? I'm a percussionist, um, but I tend to gravitate toward the music that are, that are loud, <laughs> that you hit the drums really hard. So it's a very physical activity. And that's why I'm skinny. Uh, <laughs> probably because I, things like that. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. I appreciate the answer. I think I got some of the answers. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, these have been so many really, really incredible, really insightful questions. Um, and um, we have three more questions on the line. Um, and I know we're running up on uh, the, the session is technically supposed to end at 8.15. Um, but um, Hoda, would you be okay with, with going over or, um, yeah, if, if it's okay, if you're moderating, if it's okay with you, I'm happy to stay and sip on my beer and talk. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I think, uh, we'll keep on going, I guess for everyone who, who wants to, uh, call it an evening, um, just know that I'll be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow um there's going to be a survey so we can adjust things in the future based on feedback um really want to learn from everyone during this um and um thank you all for coming and we're just going to keep on going with the questions um and i guess thank you. Thank you. and um, so I have hands up from uh, Ed Edmundo Luna. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Puto. Hello, Blee. Hi, Blee. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to commend you on a well done presentation, I thought. Yes, uh, this is the sort of thing that you've been interested in for a very long time. And uh, mm -hmm. just uh, sort of following your passions about this. And uh, 
so that is, I mean, I, I congratulate you, uh, first of all. Uh, second of all, uh, second of all, I'd like to sort of go back in terms of like traversing and trying to find uh, like your own identity, ver you know, with balancing like these other, let, let's say, uh, cultural spheres of identity. Uh, and uh, so you've known me for ver a very long time and you, you've known right. that right. I've been negotiating myself uh, as, yes. a, as a Filipino American who uh, plays Indonesian gamelan, you know, does Indonesian dance, and is now a linguist who specializes in uh, Balinese, Indonesian, and all, you know, a little bit of, uh, let's say, Philippine type languages, not that much. Uh, but I, I sort of feel that even at this point uh, in my life, that I don't really have a firm uh, foothold in a lot in, uh, I, I would say, in any sort of uh, sphere, like cultural sphere. <laughs> and I, I'm okay with that at, at the moment. It's, and I, I know that for many people, uh, it's a struggle. Um, <laughs> but since I'm here in Japan, okay, yeah, I'm coming in as an Asian, but maybe like uh, the quote unquote uh, wrong sort of Asian or like a, uh, something that's, that is not alike, you know, uh, the, most of the people that I teach here. Uh, and uh, also uh, through linguistics and through, uh, let's say my interests in um, like Balinese, uh, Javanese, uh, other, let's say Malayic, and uh, Western Austronesian languages, like I'm finding like common threads that I've grown up with and like in my later academic life and, you know, interacting with you and your father and your whole family and, uh, you know, other uh, Balinese and Javanese folks. Um, like I, I find peace in, in the fact that, oh, there are these things that we share like in common, even though uh, like many people may not realize it. Uh, so I, I, I take comfort in that fact. So uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted yeah. more comments on that. Yeah, thank you, Blee. And that's, you know, I've, you, if you didn't already know, have been a huge role model on my life, even if we've gone many years without speaking, but you've, you've always been a person that I've, I've looked up to primarily because of all the things that you've said, because, you, you know, you mentioning that you're at peace with being kind of in between everything. Um, from what I know about your, your life and your, the, the studies you've gone through, you've been basically just a whole life of acknowledging other identities and acknowledging other cultures, right? And that's something that I really look up to and uh, hope that I can also find peace with soon um, because I also do have many interests elsewhere. Uh, they tend to be on the borders of uh, abrasiveness and <laughs> contention. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's I think it's really awesome, and you know, just a, a special thank you to you and your family, and to Mama Luna, and your cousins and your brothers and sisters. Uh, our family, when we went to San Diego, wouldn't necessarily have survived if we didn't also connect with this awesome Filipino family, right? Um, so that, that's just a suksma <laughs> Um yeah, and that's man. how I feel. I don't think I believe. Thank you, Puto. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go on to uh, the next question is from uh, Sarah Lacompte. Hello, Sarah. 
You might still be muted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm from Montreal in Canada, from uh, Gamlangiri Kadaton. Um, mm. Yeah. I love Biliganjur for the same reason as you. I'm also a kit drummer. I used to play metal. Um, Ooh, and <laughs> well, I used to play metal before I was introduced to Gamelan. And uh, yeah, I and now sort of... <laughs> Yeah, so um, question for you, how in your pieces uh, merging Gamelan, like Biliganjur and metal, um, like what type of strokes do you associate with what type of technique? Like how do you, when you hear um, metal guitar, uh, what do you hear, what instruments do you hear it on? Uh, like for Chang Chang, like um, yeah. which instruments do you relate together and which techniques do you relate together in your composition? But do you compose um, Billy Ganjo that you think is kind of metal? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm working on a Balagandra composition right now that's not a transposition of a metal tune, but there are obvious metal sensibilities in it. Um, for the piece that we listened to today specifically, the Cheng Cheng Kopiak, the symbols, were imitating the larger form of um, the guitar and drums from the math core song. The only thing that I had to adapt was it, you know, when you're playing guitar, you're basically playing a kotek with your fingers, right? You're not necessarily interlocking with anyone else. So I had to sort of decontextualize and pull apart the guitar rhythms from the fingers into sort of idiomatically Chang Chang Kopiak or Balagandur Chang Chang style. So there was a lot of like uh, kotek and nalu or uh, cha, cha, like seven or Chang seven, six, and five, those kinds of things like that kind of stuff and just dismembering the guitar line rhythmically for the Cheng Cheng. In terms of melody, I wasn't too concerned with melody in this particular piece because I wanted to sort of drive the aesthetics of boisterousness and um, uh, aggression here. Um, but there is a melodic component that I completely rewrote the melody for, not the rhythms, but the, mel the melody line. Um, for Rayong specifically. So the guitar melody went over to the Rayong and they took over sort of the, the establishment of scale, tonality, and um, uh, melodic progression. So in those ways, this was how I thought about the relationship between the metal tune and the Balagandra tune. Um, and then of course, I wanted to keep that specifically the essence of the screaming, right? Because it's such a we acknowledge that the darkness exists. We want you to be appeased. Let's get our energies out in this way that you can't really do with singing in this context. Um, other than that, those were those are the main things. It's not a it's not a very intellectual piece, <laughs> so to speak. Maybe maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> but that's that's how I thought about it. And uh, thank you. Uh, and you were saying you were composing something right now. Can can you say something more about that? Yeah, so I'm composed. I'm trying to compose a Balagandur piece where I take the aesthetics of Gong Kabyar music and spe specifically the Kabyar sections of, of Gong Kabyar music, where it's played in unison, but there's no point, there's no real point of repetition. It's just through composed the whole way through, right? So I want to do that for Balagandur, but make one giant kabyar for like five minutes and see how people handle that. <laughs> so uh, that's the that's the, cen the central thesis of this of this new piece and hopefully it turns out well and hopefully we can realize it in real life uh, once the world is not so chaotic, <laughs> ironically. Well, I, I wish you can uh, one day have uh, this uh, giant kabyar happen. And I would love yeah. to hear it. Thank you so much for hey, your presentation. I might recruit you to play it, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, and then we had a, a question in the chat from DLO. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you want to um, ask that. 
Um, let me unmute you. Hi, Putu. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question was, I guess I'll just read it from the chat. Um, okay. So would you say your composition fix your face? I guess I'll start with the background because I, I did, I want to first thing, thank you Putu for inviting us to this webinar. Um, you point out that the through composed nature of the Dillinger escape plan, escape the plan, um, fix your face as an essential element to its application of compound meter, which lends itself to adapting and refusing itself into new metal subgenera. It also appears that the Pelagonger piece adapts multimeter pulse um, of metal piece as a departure from the traditionalist calatomic structure. Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear the 8B calatomic cycle in the Pelagonger piece that you composed, but um, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Um, and I guess, so that, then back to the question. Would you say that your composition uh, as a compositional piece is a reflection of a larger cultural zeitgeist of experimentalism that has been transpiring in regional Balinese slash Javanese music underground uh, music scenes for some time now? Uh, do you see Balinese artists abroad and in Bali truly exploring the limits of melodies and calatomic structures in their compositions? Um, and further, what does this piece that you composed reflect for up and coming independent artists communities today in Indonesia that are carving out their own artistic modes of expressions by refusing local gamelan music with new methodologies that may not always align to the norms and expectations of the tourist industry and consequently the expectations of what the global community sees looking inwards to Bali. Thank you in advance for answering uh, any of these questions or responding to them. Awesome, thank you for that uh, very short and concise question. Uh, <laughs> 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 it was good. So I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to, to uh, answer the questions and the, the words that um, I remember. So the first one is that the, the colatomic structure in um, this piece specifically, so when I think about colatomy, and this is something that um, I've critiqued in the past, not just because I'm off critiquing everything, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but like when we think of cyclical music, especially gamelan, there's the um, the conventional uh, or a lot of people tend to think about it cyclicity as that okay here's this rhythmic and melodic stru structure that happens and then when it happens again it happens the exact same way mm -hmm. when we know that as gamelan players and people that are familiar with cyclic music in general that's not true at all there's something there's always something slightly different later on whether it's a rhythmic break such as an angsol or something like that um so that in in those kinds of terms i follow andy mcgraw's idea of um helixes right where things morph they're cyclical in nature but as it progresses they're they change uh, not slightly, but they change for very specific reasons. And that to me is what polytonic structure does. All right. And these markers of gongs, right? Whether it's an eight beat cycle at the midpoint, there's a kamong or a quarter point, there's another uh, uh, kamong or klanong or something like that. It's supposed to reorient yourself so that when it comes around again, the thing that's changed is more effective and more useful and you can still ground yourself in this colatomic structure, right? Mm -hmm. So with the piece, I still use cycles, but the first, the main one, which I'm just gonna clap this out loud and it's kind of hard to follow, but something like that, right? This whole cycle is in 23. And I use a combination of the traditional googie lock cycle, which is, Gong, gong, boor, boor, gong, right? But I compress it a little bit. I compress the subdivisions to where it's gong, gong, right? So it's not necessarily eight beat gagilak cycle, but it functions similarly. Um, so that's the most associated with polytonic structure that I can think of um, for, for this piece that I actively was doing. And in terms of 
Um, uh, the other questions that you asked, I want to be clear that I'm not refusing gamelan or mm. rejecting it. I know that a lot of artists do, but I'm personally not doing that. Um, but I am refusing the implication that because I'm Balinese, I should be playing gamelan, right? Like, yeah, okay, that may be true to a certain extent, but I don't want my life to be dictated by what the general masses of more powered culture have to say about, about it, right? And so, to that end, I think that's the thing that will open up for Balinese musicians in and out of Indonesia. And when I say will, I, what I really mean is that it's already happened. The reason that I can do this is because a lot of Indonesian artists have done this in the past already, right? With whether it's mm -hmm. Pak Dewa Alit uh, with, with uh, Gamalan Slukat or Pak Dewa Prato with the uh, expansion of the modal system in Samaradana. These things have been done, right? I'm just coming at it from the context in which I live, so which tends to be a heavy metal one. So that was a short answer, but hopefully did something. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. That was really well, well, well said, all of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you to everyone who had so many really incredible questions. Um, I table? Feel, yeah, I feel bad about this because it's the discussion's really rolling, but I mean, we're 15 minutes plus over. Um, and I guess okay. um, maybe afterwards, um, you can, if you have extra questions, you can reply to my follow up email and we'll, we'll try to answer the burning ones. Um, and I guess before we all sign off, I'd like to just thank you, everyone again for coming out and especially thank you to Putu, our really amazing presenter. And thank you for all of your responses to the questions too. It's really, really wonderful. Um, really just um, inspiring and valuable at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for putting it together. <laughs> Me and and also Gamalan Sagarjaya and the, and a really great crew of volunteers. Um, so um, yeah, good night, everyone, and thanks for coming, Suksma. Um, and I hope that you come to some of the future ones. Actually, in September we have two uh, newly ones that new ones that haven't been announced yet, um, uh, which. I'll give you a spoiler right now. They're um, September 2nd with a uh, mother-daughter team of Ibu Emiko Susilo, who's a Gamalan Sikorja's board chair and former director, um, and her daughter, Dewa Ayu Lerasanti. Um, and then on September 9th, we have Pat Nyoman Wenten. Uh, really, really excited to have him on the series too. Um, so I hope that we'll see more of all of you, um, and sampai jumpa. Sampai jumpa, suksma everyone. Good night. Be healthy. <laughs>